<laughs> now to find out if it's actually working. Okay, it shouldn't. Aha. Second. <sighs> Wait, what? Oh no, that messed up everything. I'm sorry, I guess. Mm. I guess that will start everything from scratch. Okay, that's not terrible, I hope. <laughs> so again, let's keep, keep uh, in mind the words we are looking at. Harmonic, it's gonna be one that is a key word in this class. which means something fairly simple. It means, it means, oh no, we cannot see anything there, can we? No, nothing at all. It means that you have barely, huh? And it's upside down. <laughs> but you have something like this. There we go. Something that is like a well, a line, and it's symmetrical. Mm -hmm. And if you look squinting a lot, that should remind you of a function that is very, very common. You think you can identify what function is that? And a square. Everything that is an exponent, that it's a pair, an even number, is gonna give you that shape. What happens when you have a negative, uh, an odd number, you get this, right? So that is the harmonicity they are referring to, that you have a minimum at the bottom, and then you have a, a width that represents that graph. And harmonicity means that you cannot exceed that, right? A problem, that we're gonna see here in this text, or refer to at least in this text, is that because of the behavior of this equation or this simple function, you get asymptotic values in the borders, right? So if that represents something, there's a point, or rather several values of x that make the values of y infinitely high. The harmonicity is this. It has a symmetrical form. Then we have, um, oh yeah, here it is, oops. Their original or more Im most important goal is there in the text around here. This functional, previous functional forms cannot describe the inorganic materials such as zeolites because the equilibrium angles, the equilibrium angles are 150 and they distort to 180. Mm -hmm. So that harmonicity, you need really high temperatures or really high energies to reach those values. Because, we're gonna see why, because that is difficult to get in that other force field, they decided to do this. So let's start seeing or showing what they are doing here. 
Huh? Where is my mouse? Here. I'm gonna put it over here. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go straight to the meat. And the meat is when it will update. I don't know when it's going to be updated. Anyway, the meat of this paper is here. Oops. Mm, it's terrible. Nothing can be seen. Well, if you take to your paper to page two, what we have is on the subindex B, an equation that should read the energy equals the sum of all of these energies. Mm -hmm. And it's a letter E because this is the most classical, the most simple type of energy. This is actual actually according to thermodynamics the internal energy mm -hmm. so it's only talking about whatever you put in your structure that equation is going to relate to that so if we have um, a methane an ethane that equation only talks about that molecule okay <laughs> under certain conditions those energies can be measured and calculated and you probably did this in a thermodynamics class where you got the heats of formation right so the internal energy ends up being a product or a relationship uh, that includes those energies. And we have several components here. Uh, it's just a second. Mm. Several components of different, well, they are all associated or called E, but they are different in the sense that they are trying to refer to different things. For example, uh, we have the so-called R, which in this case corresponds to the bonds. Ah, there we go. Somebody was messing with my camera. Mm. We have R that stands for the bond. Uh, I need to move it a little bit further. We have the R that stands for the bond. This ugly letter, the one right next by my finger, should be a theta, which is always an angle. We have a phi, which is always also an angle. But in general, we are going to have something like a silly acronym. Where this one is always the bonds, B. This one is always, always the angles, A. And this one is always the dihedral angles. So we have the acronym BA. That is something that you may run into, depending on the authors, depending on the force field. Some people call them just bonds, dihedrals, and uh, bonds, angles, and dihedrals. Or every once in a while, they get they get um, uh, abbreviated to bath. Uh, sorry, I was trying to find my focus. here. No, this is... Okay, that looks sharp. I guess that's, that's the best I'm going to be able to get today. So we have bonds, angles, dihedras. We have this omega, which is another thing that we're going to cover. Van der Waals mm -hmm. and electrostatics. So this is the force field. The energy of any molecule according to this force field is going to be described by these five energies. Uh, 
in general, you are going to see that most force field contained the bath, the van der Waals and electrostatics. This one includes the omega for reasons that they are going to specify here in the text. And the rest, well, in, in many ways, so much of the paper is that, how this equation is fleshed out. For example, just the R, the ER, sorry. The ER, according to the next uh, section, the bond stretching, can take one of two forms. And we're going to stick to the first one, just for the sake of uh, reading the paper. Doctor, um, what is the inversion terms? The inversion terms. Uh, where is that? Describe. In the same equation of the... Oh, the omega. Yes, yeah. I, let's let's look at the equation to yeah. figure out. Hang on, just a second. Because it is, it is applied to the angular distortions, also. Yeah, that every so the way the equation is set up is such that everything. Everything, it's add up. What I mean is this. Uh, these equations, or at least according to what we can see here, every term is independent. And all of them have to add up to the internal energy. Doesn't matter, this can be small, this can be big, this can be the biggest. For the equation, doesn't matter, they have to adopt. Mm -hmm. That is the basic uh, assumption underlying these equations. So we're going to see what they are. And before, the, before trying to understand, sorry, let me go back. This is like classical physics. Mm -hmm. They are empirical, right? That means somebody came up with them. And it turns out that they represent things fairly accurate, right? Where those classic equations fail? The quantum mechanics realm and relativistic mechanics, right? But in the very wide range of fields, classical physics apply. These equations are not different. Somebody said, okay, how is the, what's the easiest way to represent this behavior? This equation for ER, for example, takes the form of just a distance, like in classical physics, these are um, the distances between the atoms, right? I want to see the specific... The bond yeah, sorry, the bond, the bond length. Yeah. Here we have a reference bond length. This is fixed. That is going to be a specific for pairs of atoms, and they go into that. And this is what you have in your molecule. Then there is a, a constant that later they describe how they get. Everything is divided in half and everything is squared. So that means that doesn't matter what the values are, that equation is going to roughly behave like that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what happens. What's gonna, what are the actual values of these and these two? Well, because everything changes on y, these are going to change the position here, because this is going to be r, the, the bond length, and this is going to change how narrow or wide is this going to be. The constant is what changes the... Mm -hmm. It's going to change the width. Okay. So what's going to, again, what's happening? There's going to be a reference distance, which is going to be the basic for this one, and then the, the real, or the one in the molecule. So that could be here. So if this is the R1J, and this is... So maybe I, I should be pointing out that over here. So if that... This is ER, and this one is R. Okay? 
So, uh, and actually, this minimum should be R I J. But then the bond length can be anywhere, right? And what's going to happen is that the energy is going to change. Mm -hmm. If you multiply this term, what changes is the distance between the borders. Mm -hmm. Now, here is something that you should always keep in mind because everybody talks about it, but nobody tells you why this is so. Just because the equation for the bond length has that shape, it means that you cannot really break a bond with molecular mechanics. The energy becomes infinitely high. There's always bonds. It can be the form with as much energy as you can, but this bond is never going to be broken. Covalent bonds cannot be broken in molecular mechanics. In the uh, next page, Just a second. Okay, this should work. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect. So we have this other equation, the Morse function, and this one is oh, slightly different. But it still contains the obvious terms, the energy, the distance, the bond length, sorry, and a couple of other parameters and an exponential. So we here in have, have two exponentials, the, natu the natural E and the square. The shape's still going to be the same because every value that could be negative, it's going to be turned into a positive and we're going to have the same harmonicity. A difference uh, in this one is that it includes this term, that is the constant, it's embedded in this, uh, in this alpha, sorry. Uh, and it's supposed to represent, to be able to represent the breaking of bonds, as it says down below. But I actually haven't seen that view, so I don't know how, how well it, it behaves. It also says that it can be better for an harmonicity. So I think maybe this, uh, what is it? This square root changes part of the behavior of the exponential of the square. This other version of the energy for the bonds, it's also very well known, but I don't know why it hasn't become mainstream. It's not that used. Maybe because the breaking of bonds is, even if you can break it, you, unless you want to have radicals, that is loose electrons, doesn't make much sense, mm -hmm. unless you redistribute the electrons, and this equation cannot do the opposite, forming the bonds. I, I really don't know. This is a speculation. What else? Okay, so that is mostly for that equation. As you can see, again, the energy that relates to the bond, it's a simple thing. They describe further down how they calculate the K. So in a way, what, what is a parameter? That was one of the questions that we have to ask. This is going to be a parameter. Mm -hmm. What is the equilibrium bond length? And what is the energy, uh, how do they call it? The force constant for that bond. So what they're trying to say is what you learn in organic chemistry, that this R, Ij, it's atom pair specific. There's going to be one for carbon and carbon, one for carbon and hydrogen, 
you name it. And the K2, the K is going to depend, be dependent on what are those atoms. Mm -hmm. So those two are parameters. We need to know them because the, otherwise the equation is meaningless. And the R is the actual X in this equation. Our E is going to be the Y, this is going to be the X, and the rest are the parameters. Right? Once we have those parameters, that this force field can be applied. That's why we have this table down here. Uh, sorry. Let's see. Should be like this. Let me try to fit it. That's why we have that table down there with all of the values that they've been able to get from the literature for, for the distance that the first column is going to be exactly that, the standard distance for pairs, then the angles, which we're going to see in the other equations are used, and distances for non-bonded interactions, as well as the effective charge. So this table is, in fact, most of the parameters that this force field is going to use. It's going to use all of these things. And all of these things are going to be dependent on the atom, and as you read from the paper, the type of interactions they have, the hybridization. For example, here we have these types of carbons, which should be um, sp3 resonant, sp2, and sp1, right? Where sp? All of them are going to have subtly different bond lengths, which should decrease the, slow, the lower the, uh, what is it called? Well, the lower the SP, and everything else changes too. We can see that, for example, uh, the one that is going to form triple bonds, the C lower dash one, can reach an angle of 180, which is what we are expecting for that type of chemical. Uh, yes. They even go into detail. Oh, sorry, I did something silly there into the detail of how those R's are calculated. There we go. So that, that R is now, and this is still kind of the first sentence in the paper. These distances, these standard distances, are going to be dependent on the atomic radii of the at one atom and the other. Right? This simplistic sum accounts for the fact that two objects cannot occupy the same space. So unless there is a bond, this is as close as these atoms can get. They cannot overlap. Mm -hmm. You need the bond for them to overlap. And then we have these two other factors, the BO and the EN, which are correction factors. As they describe below, they need those to account for two very important phenomena, which are uh, polarization. And the other one, What's the other one? Yes, electronegativities. So it should be clear from, yes, from the ac acronyms. EN for electronegativities and the BO for the polarization. Also, wh how are they calling it? That is not abbreviated like BO. Anyway, that RBO, it's trying to account for uh, electronegativity, resonance, metal ligand pi bonding, uh, stack back bonding, and trans insurance. Pretty much everything that is an actual electronic phenomenon of the atoms, it's tried to be summed in that RBO, uh, which is not described. Oh, yes, here. Sorry, it's going to be down there at the bottom. The electronegative is there. We have uh, corrections that imply square roots and then squares. Again, the same harmonic form. And this one is just a logarithmic equation. And if you can figure that out, it's just something that is very important in short, short ranges. I should probably just draw it. So a logarithm, it's going to be what 
Why is it going to be? I don't want to make a mistake here. Should be something like that, right? So it should be the most important, the closest to the initial values, and it, it tapers off. But it's not going to become asymptotic. Still, at least on one side of the graph, it's going to be pretty much like if it was an exponential. But then you have another exponential later. So the addition is still going to represent something that is kind of the same shape. So whatever you do, <laughs> the energy of the bond, because it depends on these r's, mm -hmm. it's going to be shaped like an exponential to the power of 2, right? Mm -hmm. Bonds are not going to be able to be broken, and we have no way to escape. Sorry, I lost here. We're not going to be able to escape the influence of this exponential on 1a. That exponential 2 is going to define this equation. Okay, All of this math, just to describe the bonds. Why? In a way, as we can see from their table, everything, that the way they are setting up their, their force field, depends on the properties of the atoms, and in those properties is the bonds. The length they're going to have, and how many they can make. In a way, this is the weakest part of these force fields. Something, even, even if we consider that the bonds cannot be broken, just by looking at the table, the idea that you should have is that if you don't know the properties of the atoms and include them in the force field, this is not going to work. And it doesn't allow for an atom to change. If you said whatever you are doing to use... Uh, I don't know, pick anything, cesium 6 plus 3. If you pick that one as the representative of your molecule, that's it. It's not going to be able to change in your representation, even if there could be the possibility of drawing electrons or seeding electrons. It's going to be fixed. So it's a representation, it's a model that is fixed by those properties. The same for the resonance, pretty much the same for everything. It has an interesting thing that you can always appreciate, and it's the charges. The charges are not integral. Mm -hmm. And I haven't understood quite why this force field did that. My guess is that it took those, that information from references, and they just stick to it. Sometimes that can happen. Part of the reason to show you this paper that is so old is because that approach is now disappearing. This idea of having a set of fixed universal charges is uh, no longer in use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the, for the force constants, notice that we're still on the bonds, right? Because we have the R's, that is a parameter that we just see, we just uh, saw that requires some calculation. And now the force constant. The, for cons the force constant, that is the K1, uh, the Kij, comes from a very simple assumption, that equation over here, that is um, integrated, the energy for, what is the distance? Mm -hmm. And it gives us this functional form. If you look at that, that looks awfully similar to what we have for the Coulomb equation. We have to take into account the charges. There is that uh, g, 2g, that is constant, but the distance is not now to the cube okay so that equation it's gonna look like that on this is okay but past the inflection it's always gonna be on this quadrant and under the inflection is always going to be on these quadrants. Mm -hmm. But this is just the force constant, okay? In a way, depending on what is going to happen, what this says is pretty much the same as we are expecting again for classical mechanics. Once things get too close, 
they shouldn't overlap. They actually, if you bring an atom, let's assume that this is the distance, which is going to represent that. If you bring two atoms so close together that they overlap, the energy around him is going to make them to go away to, a, to an equilibrium distance. But if you to try to force them, you can probably force them, but they are going to always repair themselves. They are not going to find the minimum of a, um, an even exponent. They are not going to get stuck here. Now, this is the equation, right? We saw last time we used Avogadro that sometimes the atoms get stuck. And that's because this equation has to be transported into something that the computer can calculate, and that is not perfect. What I'm trying to say is these equations are not what the computer uses. On top of these equations, there's algorithms in the computers that try to calculate that. None of them is perfect, they can make mistakes. But the basic, so if we were to work with these many atoms, we could probably do that by hand. Would we like to do it? No, nah, not at all. Why waste time doing that? But you could do it by hand. If you are working with coenzyme A, you are not going to be able to do it by hand. Period. Not in any significant way. And that is one of the things that had changed. Uh, if you have the time, I recommend you check the Nobel Prize lecture by Carplus. Kevin? I always mix, mix up his name. Kevin Carplus. And he shows the first molecular dynamics he performed. He is one of the fathers of that field in biology. And you can, you, I bet you cannot believe how simple it was back in the day. I mean, it is, I'm talking about the 1960s, maybe the early 70s. Mm -hmm. Just amazing. And Kevin Carplus is, is like a great guy, really, really great guy. I wonder if he still answers his email. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, that is <laughs> up to this page, two pages, we just fulfill or finish describing all of the parameters that go into the bond stretch. The force constant and the uh, specific distances between the atoms, all of them require calculations. But, but, but these calculations are pretty much simple or set because once you have defined which are the pairs of atoms, all of this is set, right? Technically, this K and the R I J have to only be calculated once, and then you can use it in the equation. This, in, a, in, in Avogadro, sometimes is referred just as setting up the force field. What are the molecules you have? What are the types of atoms? Okay, here is the list, there you go. Now they are parameterized, okay? Uh, what's next? The angular distortions. This one, uh, that one. Mm -hmm. That one, for whatever reason, was not in the original equation, right? It's added here because it might be used or it's a general way to describe that equation. And as you can see, this equation is really simple and may form part later of the, um, what is it called? The inversions. Why do I say that? How does that equation will behave? I don't think so. Let's look at it again. I'm gonna copy it to my paper. Like a wave, yeah, but what characteristic it's going to manifest? Mm -hmm. So there's the, uh, what did I do? Ah, I don't know how to draw this, apparently. So this is what we have there. An E, gamma that it's equal to a k, a constant, and the sum, sorry for my sum sign, of cn times the cosine of n gamma. So this gamma, these two values over here represent, and of course it's implied over here, that this is going to represent the sum of certain values. 
And the way this is gonna look, because it's the cosine, I think it should start here and it should oscillate in a way that it's gonna represent these two values, right? Mm -hmm. That is, the, the energy shouldn't change, or rather, it's gonna be limited to the maximum, that it's gonna be the same for everything. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because it's oscillating like this, it's the sum. And the frequency, or this separation, is also gonna be determined by these two terms. What, what are they? Now, think about the chemistry that you study. Down here, we could have a stagger ethane in the minimum. And if these angles or the positions of his hydrogens rotate, they are going to reach a maximum. Uh, sorry, I, I made the angle, sorry. Where they are eclipsed, and then the energy is the maximum. But if you move past that angle, you return to a similar conformation to this one, and it's gonna have the same energy. So this is the inversion. I think this is the inversion they are talking about. If you keep rotating that molecule, it's gonna reach a minimum when it's perfect, everything is a stagger. You twist it, it reaches a maximum, and then it goes back to a minimum. But it's a different minimum. Technically, if we could label the hydrogens, we could find that hydrogen one and two now are in different positions, okay? So that is the way this equation accounts for that. It needs to include that the angles go through that process. For an angle that is <clears throat> three points, it's gonna mean exactly the same. there's gonna be a specific positions for that angle that are gonna be isoenergetic. When are, gonna be, when are those positions gonna be located? In a way, it's gonna be dependent on the type of bonding. For sp3, you're gonna have three. For sp2, if bonds could rotate, you're gonna have two. And for sp, you shouldn't have more than one. You have a fixed position. They can, there cannot be inversions there, okay? So this equation, or at least this form of an equation, accounts for that. And in the case of uh, aromatic rings, this equation applies to... Well, it's a double bond, so it shouldn't do that, unless you have really, really high energies. What is going to change, or actually, see, that's a very good question. What will be the problem that you will get in one of these force fields if... If you have a combination of um, of an aromatic sorry of an aromatic carbon are a very strong or a very electronegative atom, is is that carbon bonded to the very strong electronegative atom still aromatic? That is a question that is a problem for this one. How do you represent those complexities? In fact. We can use a simple example, such as a peptidic bond. How do you represent the nature, the partial resonance nature of the peptidic bond with a force field like this? Will it make sense? So in a way we can, if, this, if we were to use this, we should have to test it against that. How does it represent an amino acid or a peptide? Will it make it flat as we're expected? I mean, the peptidic bond will be flat as expected, or wouldn't it? No. I don't know. I, actually, I don't know. It, it's going to be clearly dependent on how you pick which atoms represent that interaction. And this is a problem that used to be solved by adding new atoms. Ah, well, it's the carbon in the peptidic bond is special, and the nitrogen too. So now you have more atom types. If you were to count this table, how many, well, not, not this table, if you were to count how many atom types we need to represent all of the periodic table, how many times bigger <laughs> is gonna be our atom table? For carbon, just for carbon, we need to have four types. 
Uh, and in this case, right, if we don't include biological things, we only have, we have three. Mm -hmm. We will have to add more if we have specialized atoms. And then now you have the periodic table times the number of types of interactions that you can get. So this atom typing, as it's used to call, it's kind of cumbersome because you end up with things that are precise but fixed to very specific cases. Uh, let me see, angle bend. Yeah, the angle bend, sorry, uh, just be, so to jump between equations. The angle bend is going to be also very similar in the form of the equation to, the, uh, to that other correction, right here, another cosine. So we're going to have the same wave. But remember, and, and if I'm mistaken, please let me know, it has to have the form of the wave I draw. And not only that, it means, as far as I remember, that there's that zero, zero beginning. That is, in this point, in this coordinate, at the origin, they have to coincide. Am I wrong? You sure? I better make sure. Because that is the only difference between using sine and cosine. They should give you exactly the same result, but out of phase. Why will it give me a cosine map? Mm. Sorry, let me find uh, one that is... Okay, no, I'm, I'm mistaken. It's the other way around. This is a good example. Oh, sorry, didn't change my screen. Uh, it's going to be moved to the center in a second. There. So the cosine starts at, at the maximum value. What I draw was the sine. Starts in the maximum value and then goes down. Why is that important? Because our frame of reference, whatever our x are, the values of the distance, the values of the angle, it says by definition that at zero, you're in the maximum energy. Does that make sense? Think of a dihedra. If we are eclipsed, we are all, already at the maximum energy. We need to move away to go to the minimum. And you can picture, you can picture as if it was a sphere. If you start in this energy, you have to roll down. It can be in either direction. It can be, let's say, from zero degrees to 120. That's the case of uh, ethane. Or to minus 120. But it's exactly the same because the shape of the cosine makes it so that the minimum, it's exactly the same energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it easier or harder to read it like this? Yeah, but once you read it like this, you know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. You can only stretch. You are going to, uh, or maybe not, but if you start reading this from the macromolecule point of view, you hear simplifications such as in molecular mechanics, atoms are spheres and bonds are springs. And that doesn't convey what this equation are telling us. Yes, it's a spring, but it's a spring that you can stretch easily close to the equilibrium or the, the standard distance. But as you try to pull it further away, it becomes ridiculously difficult to stretch, right? The angles can be get close together, but they are going to behave uh, like that. They are going to go down easily, and they are going to be taken high with difficulty, right? So they are going to represent whatever we like it or not, that there is these orientations of the molecules that have high energy. But they don't have the same behavior as the exponentials, where the energy becomes ridiculously high. It's just smooth. And what it says, too, is that if you have more of these angles, the only thing that is going to change is the width. The energy, the total energy, is never going to change. It remains fixed. 
both the maximum and the minimum remain fixed and the only thing that changes is how often you find that maximum or minimum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Doctor, and for this equation, the... Which, the theta? Yeah. Does the graphic is going to change because I can see that now is for the force constant and in this... Well, are we talking about the this? 9A? No, no, in the, the equation 8. 8. Well, this is not changing anymore. Hmm. Yes, equation 8. Yeah, because in this equation use the force constant. Uh, well, it uses a K. This is yeah. a capital K. Not, it's, a, it's a constant for sure and a force constant, but it's not the same one as before. No, just that's me. Oh, that's a question? If it's the same as before? No, this is a different one. I don't see where is it coming from. Yeah, I don't know where it's coming from. But in a way, we don't care. Still, if they are following their own pattern of equations, it means that that capital K, it's also atom dependent. And so, but sorry, let me, let me just double check something. Yes, this, the difference that you should be aware, clearly aware in this case, is that this K, this capital K, is a constant that it's going to represent three atoms. That's why it's I, J, K. Because it's an angle, right? You need three points in space to represent an angle. So that first constant is bond, two atoms. Any angle, or at least the simplest algo angles, are going to require three points, right? That's what you need for an angle, one point, two point, three point. And that tells you that those angles are just that. But there's going to be angles, the dihedrals, that require four points. So those are going to require I, J, K, and L. And, and clearly these are not those yet. Uh, yes, uh, if we were to continue, we will see that there is the standard uh, bond angles, they follow the same pattern as with the distance, what is what you're expecting? That is, in many ways, what that is asking is, what is gonna be, where is the minimum gonna be located for this specific trio of atoms? Which is, if this gets updated, yes, the delay is terrible, yes. The position of this minimum, it's gonna be different for trios of atoms, right? If we have, and you already know that, if we have a metal, the position for this angle from hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen is going to be a value, x. But if you have hydrogen, carbon, carbon, that is going to change, right? Uh -huh. The shape of the equation can be exactly the same, but the position of this gets slightly moved. And the, not the amplitude, the frequency is also going to change, right? How often are you going to find a minimum between carbons? It's going to be different than between hydrogens. Why? Just because of the size, because of the bond length, because of the angle, the standard angle. But it can move about, right? This equation allows for that. You can rotate that bond, whatever the atoms are, mm -hmm. which is what's important for the representation. We don't have a rigid molecule. It's something that can rotate depending on the types of bonds, depending on the types of atoms. Let's uh, stop here because we can keep going on. And the equations don't go simpler. Actually, they become quite complex. And the reason is because they want to include everything, every single atom. So they cannot go for the simplest forms of the equations. In fact, that is something that sometimes gets so complex that the implementation of these force fields is difficult because you need so many things that you cannot really uh, scale. That is, this might work perfectly for a couple of atoms, but then you have a hundred, you have a thousand, and it's not really good. We'll continue on this one, on the inversion. Oh, sorry, no, we we'll skip the, the phi, the other, the other uh, angle. 
We are going to continue with that because that's the torsion that involves four atoms, as you can see in the K, K, I, J, L, or did I spell it right? You need four points because we are talking about this. Mm -hmm. Let's continue with that next class. <laughs>